We will, with great pleasure, move to the next presentation by William Coleman, a noted authority on all aspects of economics and indeed Australian history as well. Uh, so again, the aim is we'll leave uh, 10 minutes or so at the end for questions and discussion. So please welcome William Coleman. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alan. It is indeed a, a great pleasure to be part of this worthy initiative of the John Curtin Institute of Public Policy and the Mankell Economics Foundation. Adam Smith on Australia. That may seem like an unlikely topic. Thanks to the electronic circuit engine, we may state with perfect confidence that Adam Smith never, either in the Wealth of Nations or any other of his leading works, passed a single remark about the geography, inhabitants, or society of Australia. But nevertheless, I feel licensed to launch on the topic by observing that at one point in his life, Smith almost had a profound influence, namely by affecting the choice of the command of the endeavour. At a critical point in the preparation of the expedition of the endeavour, Smith weighed in to have not James Cook, but a certain Alexander Dalrymple placed on the bridge. Dalrymple, born in Edinburgh of a Scottish noble family, was not bereft of qualifications to captain the, the, uh, the endeavour. Between 1759 and 1764, he had voyaged the Philippines and Borneo in an attempt to discover a new route to China. Uh, by way of New Guinea. Having done so, he returned to London and published an account of the discoveries made in the South Pacific Ocean prior to 1764, where he revealed himself to be a visionary of the existence in the Pacific of an as yet undiscovered terra incognita. Of its unexplored extents, he declared, not only many large islands swarm with people, it is more than probable that another continent will be found there, extending about 30 degrees south of the pole. Shortly thereafter, his vivid speculations intersected <coughs> with the enterprises of a more sober science. For the Royal Society had rightly judged that the South Pacific would be an especially suitable place to observe the transit of Venus across the face of the sun and proposed to the king that a naval expedition be sent to the South Seas to observe it. To Dalrymple's mind, an opportunity to be the Christopher Columbus of his terra incognita had suddenly materialised. And his most important contact in the pursuit of that opportunity would be Adam Smith. For Dalrymple's family was part of Scotland's intellectual elite. His older brother, Lord Hales, had collected a library of great reputation at the family seat, New Hales House, which was also a regular gathering place of all the great and the good of the Scottish Enlightenment. Hales and Adam Smith were in fact fellow members of the Scotland's select society. And Smith in turn was linked to a person central to the expedition of the endeavour. But the king had entrusted his wish for an expedition to William Petty Fitzmaurice, the Earl of Shelburn, then Secretary of State for the Southern Department, which was the 18th century equivalent of the later colonial office. Shelbourne was a great admirer of Smith. He'd entrusted his education of his son and his younger brother to Adam Smith. You might even say he'd entrusted his own. He later declared, I owe to Mr Smith the difference between light and darkness. Smith finally was evidently very ready to press Dalrymple's case on Shelburne. In a letter to Shelburne of the 12th of February, 1766, Smith deposed of his fellow Scott and his geographical theories, whether this continent exists or not may be uncertain, but supposing that it does exist, I am very certain you will never find a man fitter for discovering it or more determined to hazard everything to discover it. Strong words. But to the Royal Navy, 
it was unendurable that any of its ships be directed by any other than an officer of the Navy. And on the 3rd of April, 1768, Dalrymple's hopes were decisively extinguished. The endeavour departed, with Cook on the quarter deck, a copy of the account of the discoveries made in the South Pacific in the hold, but no Dalrymple. So, there was no intersection between Smith and Australia in the matter of events. On the face of it, neither was there in his writings. As I have noted, despite Smith's interest in exploration, particularly that of Torres and Kiros, despite only a copy of William Dampier's Voyage to New Holland, despite the rage for Cook on the endeavour's return from its voyage, and despite later the planned colony of Botany Bay being all the talk of London town, despite even the raw possibility of Smith including some reference to the resulting Sydney Cove settlement in the final edition of The Wealth of Nations, which came out in 1789, Smith passes no word on Australia. And yet I believe, I contend, that Smith had a great deal to say about the first generation of settlement at Sydney implicitly. Why do I say this? Because he had a great deal to say about mercantilism, the policy regimen which aimed to extinguish from economic life any competition from foreign sources. Mercantilism was Smith's great foe in policy, and mercantilism had the infant settlement of Sydney Cove firmly, firmly in its grip for the first 30 years. It did so by several means. Firstly, the Navigation Acts. In summary, these acts ordained that British colonies could only import from Great Britain. Indeed, could only export to Great Britain. In other words, foreigners could neither supply what the colonies wanted, nor demand what the colonies had to supply. And this was reinforced by a ban on non-British merchant ships conducting any part of the trade of British colonies. And these injunctions apply to New South Wales no less than in any other British colony. Thus, on the 20th, 20th of July, 1806, Governor King sternly advised the colonists of Sydney Cove, that every British subject is forbidden from entering into any mercantile contract with the subjects of foreign powers <coughs> on pain of being sent from the colony. In 1816, the Colonial Office reminded Governor Macquarie that the trade of foreign vessels with a British colony is directly at variance with the navigation laws. And in the same year, an American schooner in Sydney Harbour was confiscated as a lawful prize under the Navigation Acts. It's not difficult to see that this prohibition of foreign supply to the Sydney Cove settlement would raise prices. And we can easily have a little market supply and demand sketch of the market for imports in New South Wales. We can think of a supply schedule from Britain, a demand schedule for imports into New South Wales from New South Wales, of course. We can add a supply schedule from the rest of the world, and if indeed there's no navigation acts and there's free trade with the rest of the world, the price in New South Wales, we might think, would be the same as the price in the rest of the world. There are some imports from Britain, some imports for the rest of the world. Of course, if you abolish that purple line, if you abolish, if you prohibit supply from the rest of the world, then price in New South Wales will be elevated above the price in the rest of the world. In fact, Smith did not embrace with, with much conviction this seemingly obvious conclusion about the impact of the navigation laws on the cost of living in British colonies. In The Wealth of Nations, he spoke rather dismissively of the, quote, little enhancement in price which these laws had on the price of imports in the North American colonies. I think I can see why. Any enhancement in price, any such enhancement, would, after all, be to the benefit of British exporters. And Smith was determined to show that these navigation laws would harm not only the colonies, but also Britain itself. But if Smith was unexpectedly forbearing regarding the navigation laws, he was very hot to censure a second shaft of mercantilist policy regime. That is, a characteristic institution of mercantilism the exclusive company, that is to say, the legal monopoly created by the state with the purpose of engrossing to it the business of some sector of the economy. The ex supreme example of the East India Company, of, of this, the exclusive company, was the East India Company. By a royal charter, 
confirmed by successive Acts of Parliament, the East India Company had been granted a monopoly over the trade of Great Britain with any portion of the world located between the Cape of Good Hope and the Straits of Magellan. New South Wales was evidently squarely within the company's zone of monopoly. New South Wales could import from and export to um, Great Britain and indeed to our empire or indeed any part of the Indo-Pacific only with the consent of the East India Company and on the terms of the East India Company. And the East India Company did not overlook its rights. It has been speculated that the company kiboshed the plan of 1783 to settle New Holland with American loyalists on the account of its potential threats such as set settlement would pose to the company's trade monopoly. It is a fact that in 1790, the company's directors, its court, as it was known, in London, instructed a survey to be made of the most eligible passenger ships <coughs> using the eastern route, as it called it, to China. Accordingly, in February of 1793, Captain John Hayes set, sailed south from Bombay, eastward across the Southern Ocean, until he reached the Don Tricasto Estuary in Tasmania where he sailed up river as far as New Norfolk, naming as he went Mount Direction, Risdon Cove, Cornelian Bay, various other landmarks of um, the Durant River, which he also named. After six weeks there, he ventured into the Tasman Sea, sailing north until he reached the northwestern coast of New Guinea, where he hoisted the British flag at Doré Bay with a 21-gun <coughs> salute, took possession of what he called New Albion on behalf of the King. Thus, Australia, may have been on the edge of the map of the company's map, it may have been the ultimate fall, but it was definitely on the company's map. Neither did the law look askance at the company's presumptions with respect to Australia. On the contrary, it affirmed it. William Eden, a familiar of Smith and Britain's trade envoy to France, was also a prison reformer and very interested in transportation as a substitute for convict hulks in the Thames. In his History of New Holland of 1787, brought out amid the active discussion of the plans for Botany Bay, he affirmed that New South Wales could never, on account of the East India Company's charter, possess any commerce of its own. In full sympathy with this, Governor Phillips' instructions forbade outright the construction of any ships within New South Wales in case the new colony did seek to possess a commerce of its own. The significance for this talk of the company's universally acknowledged claim to New South Wales trade was that the company's was one of Smith's bait noir, one of his black beasts. The East India Company to Smith was an absurdity, a nuisance to every respect. Its presence in Asia and its absence from America explained why Asian trade plotted along, while American trade exploded. The company transformed dearth into famine and made India a place of want, famine and mortality. It sounds pretty bad, doesn't it, for New South Wales? Why was Smith so hostile to the company? Well, because it was a monopoly and the benefits of competition was one of the leading ever-present themes of Smith's political eco economy. In terms of um, modern analysis, we can easily see that again in terms of our little supply and demand model of New South Wales, if the supply, if we've managed to keep out supply from the rest of the world, the Navigation Acts, if we add monopoly, if we allow um, supply of imports from Britain to be monopolised by the East India Company, we can see the price will no longer be the familiar supply and demand price at the intersection of those two schedules, but price will be deliberately driven up to what I've pictured there, the price in New South Wales. But to Smith, the company, the East India Company, was worse than simply being a monopoly. It was also a joint stock company. In today's language, the East India Company was a publicly listed company, a company with many owners or shareholders as we call them. To Smith, as a general proposition, to have many owners of any company 
is to have no owner in control. So too, who does own a joint stock company or a um, publicly listed company, as we would call them? Well, management, or in Smith's language, the servants of the company. And predictably, they exercise their control to benefit themselves. So the company maximised not profits, but managerial incomes. So if we think, if we look at our diagram, and we take advantage of the fact that the supply curve is also the marginal cost curve, we can see what orthodox theory would predict would be the profits of, of the monopoly company. I've shaded it in in that brown colour. But if a management is in control, what we won't have that level of profits. Profits won't be maximised. Rather, costs will be padded out. The company's board, the Court of Governors, would obviously not would obviously refuse anything which they knew to be cost padding, which they knew to be cost padding, excuse me. But what would the court in London know about the true cost of undertakings in India? Consequently, profusion, I'm quoting Smith here, profusion, therefore, must always prevail, more or less, in the management of the affairs of any joint stock company, says Smith. Figure six, which I'll go on to, um, illustrates a relatively restrained form of cost padding. The, the actual cost of the marginal unit <coughs> is represented to the board or the court to be also the cost of all inframarginal units. The red shaded area is successfully transferred from owners to, to managers, though output and price are not actually altered. But the analysis is incomplete. Managers here to be solding, holding back a bit. For if managers in this figure are exaggerating the cost of the inframarginal units, they are still truthfully reporting the cost of the marginal unit. Why not exaggerate the cost of all units? You would not want to overdo it, of course, as any exaggeration of costs or marginal costs will induce the court, the board, to reduce output. Ooh, there's some sort of optimal degree of exaggeration on the management's part as far as cost padding goes. And for this particular diagram, it can be demonstrated that that's the optimal degree of misrepresentation <laughs> of marginal costs. Um, you can see that profits are very badly hit. And as Smith observes, the profusion of the company's own servants sold them allows the dividend of the company to exceed the ordinary rate of profit, despite it being a monopoly and very frequently makes it fall a good deal short of that rate, as it would here. But of course, for New South Wales, the stinging implication is that price is even higher than under the ordinary monopoly price, and quantity is even lower than under the ordinary monopoly price. As Smith observes, the consumer pays not only for all the extraordinary profits which the company makes on on goods in consequence of the monopoly, but for all the extraordinary waste and abuse inseparable from the affairs of a great company managed in this way. So given this double whammy, not, a, not only monopoly but also cost padding, um, it looks bad for the uh, inhabitants of New South Wales. And Smith would well expect smuggling as a response to this squeeze. In The Wealth of Nations, he pressed that in the face of the East Indian Company's monopoly on imports of tea into Great Britain, the majority of tea, the great bulk of tea consumed in Britain, was actually smuggled in. So Smith would not be surprised that the nooks and crannies of convict transports in New South Wales were crammed with smuggled goods in an attempt to defy the East India Company's monopoly and to take advantage of the high prices in the colony. But Smith would have further pressed that this smuggling going on was not going to be simply restricted to criminal types, you know, convicts. For the smuggler, he wrote, is frequently incapable of violating those laws of natural justice. 
and would have been in every respect an excellent citizen had not the laws of his country made that a crime which nature never meant to be so. Smith was then um, very ready to observe that frequently it was the respectable servants or management of the East India Company, so well placed and so well empowered, which assumed the role of the smuggler in the East India Company's zone of control. The servants, he observed, naturally endeavoured to establish the same monopoly in favour of their own private trade as of the public trade of the company. What Smith is saying is the company's servants seek to monopolise the smuggling and in doing so restrict the amount of smuggling so as to drive up the profits of smuggling. <laughs> so if we think of smuggling in a competitive situation when all can smuggle, profits from smuggling fall to zero and the price in New South Wales will be the price of the rest of the world. However, we can also think of, of smuggling being controlled, okay, by the, by the servants of the company. And therefore, they, they reduce the amount of smuggling in order to maximise smuggler profits, indicated here. Now, when the price is higher, then they still believe the company's ordinary monopoly price, you'll obviously observe. Now, in the New South Wales case, it wasn't so much the servants of the company which were assuming that role, rather it was the servants of the Crown, namely the New South Wales Corps. Okay? The situation of Figure 9 is very reminiscent of New South Wales under the New South Wales Corps between 1793 and 1811, which ran the smuggling in New South Wales to the cost of the company, to the benefit of themselves, but also to the benefit of the, new, of the people of New South Wales. My final remarks <coughs> refer to the fact that there is a third and final dimension of early New South Wales peculiar and beleaguered existence, which Smith had implicitly much to say on, one which belonged to the same historical epoch as mercantilism and is tied up with it, transportation and convictism. Mercantilism and convictism are connate phenomena and that they are both grounded in the appearance, use and abuse of colonies. But the analytical kinship of convictism of most significance to Smith was its close kinship analytically to slavery. The various evils of slavery was almost a preoccupation of Smith. And one of its several evils, to Smith's mind, was that it was economically inefficient. It was inefficient because it constituted a de facto 100% marginal tax rate on effort of the slave, 100% marginal tax rate on any innovations in the productive process of the slave, and 100% marginal tax rate on investment by the slave in their own human capital, particularly their health and their skills. These inefficiencies of slavery were so considerable that they overwhelmed any benefits from the low pay in slaves. I believe, he says, that the work done by free men comes cheaper in the end than that performed by slaves. It is found to do so even in Boston, New York and Philadelphia, where the wages of common labour are so high. These criticisms of the inefficiency of slavery obviously extend to any species of forced labour, including convict labour. So Smith would not be surprised by the high consumption of rum in New South Wales, so destructive of human capital. If you're a convict, what's the reward for appearing to work refreshed and sober rather than spent and hung over? the inferiority of the industrious of convicts to free labour, Smith himself had observed. The Portuguese Jews, he wrote, having been banished to Brazil, introduced by their example some sort of industry among the transported felons by whom that colony was originally peopled and taught the felons the cultivation of sugarcane. In the face of this, Smith would not be surprised by the emergence, toleration, encouragement of a free labour system of convict labour. Thus, an old city town, the practice soon emerged that in the afternoon, not the morning, but in the afternoon, most convicts would work on their own account for wages for a private sector employer with no supervision beyond that. The early days of the Botany Bay colony were one of economic frustration and hardship. With some force, EOG Shan's Economic History of Australia depicts that. 
dismal scene. I might underline, underline Shan's eloquence with a single quantitative observation. At the opening of 1792, after four years of settlement, the Botany Bay or Sydney Cove settlement comprised of 2,870 persons but just six horses. Fortunately, the newly instituted New South Wales Corps was soon to import horses in violation of the East India Company's monopoly. And at least the breeding of horses not forbidden, unlike the construction of ships. In the light of the encumbrances of mercantilism and forced labour which shackled the settlement, Sydney Smith would not be surprised at the difficulty of the Sydney Cove settlement. I venture a rational inference from the pages of Wealth of Nations would be to predict its early economic plight. So while Adam Smith made no explicit remark touching on Australia, I argue that the Wealth of Nations is insightful and explanatory of the struggle of the first generation of European settlement in Australia. And we should not be surprised. First generation New South Wales was not only a fragment of the British Empire, it was also a fragment of 18th century Britain. And the 18th century Britain and her empire was Smith's principal subject. No other economist of the first rate speaks quite so directly to specific, or specifically to Australian experience in that first generation of settlement, as Smith does. We are close to him. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Could you? Um, I, I, thank you for your question. The age of mercantilism really came to an end uh, by about 1830. So the East India Company's monopoly on trade in New South Wales was uh, substantially reduced in 1822 and finally came to a complete end about 1832. So really by the time Western Australia um, um, and Vic Victoria, South Australia being settled, they were no longer under the purview, fortunately, of the East India Company. So that is, that is why its reference is New South Wales. Right, anyone else? Yeah. So a couple of them here. Thanks so much, William. That was awesome. Um, really enjoyed it. I just had a quick question. Um, when Adam Smith was really critical of monopolies and how they cost society um, so much inefficiency overall, um, <laughs> is, is there any, like, does he give any kind of uh, discussion or I'm just wondering points wise uh, to like R&D and like how that can come from monopolies? Like, did he see any good side of it or Adam not really? Smith is a very many-sided author. But I'm not sure, and I can be corrected by fellow Smithians here, if he ever actually put in a good word for monopoly. Yes, it is true that later students of, of R&D, particularly under Schumpeter and influence and otherwise, have thought that, hey, a monopoly um, has, has almost a de facto patent on whatever it discovers because, you know, there aren't any other companies to steal their ideas in the first place. And maybe monopoly isn't such a bad thing for innovation. I don't notice that specific idea in um, Smith. Um, so I, I think the simple answer is, is uh, no. His ideas of innovation um, were very individual ideas, and let's face it, it was pre-R&D days, mm -hmm. right? There was no such thing as the invention factory. It was just the small boy operating a steam engine, noting that you could save some movement by tying one bit to another bit, this sort of thing. It was from the factory floor. That was in the very innovation came. There was another question there, wasn't there? 
Sorry, I didn't say thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, William. Also, really enjoyed it. My question uh, is about uh, your observation on Smith on slavery, and I wondered, um, can you perhaps speculate what Smith might have thought about a basic wage today? The basic wage. Well, the basic wage I take to be a minimum wage, a sort of legislated minimum wage. Um, look, it's hard to say because there, there were um, there were things called poor laws, um, which sometimes prescribed minimum wages for agricultural labourers. But Smith wasn't particularly fond of the poor laws in general, because it because they usually required the poor labourer to stay in the county of their birth. And he thought this was um, just disallowing the movement of people um, and, and obstructive. I'm not sure whether Smith had anything particular to say about a minimum wage law um, in the abstract. Sorry, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of an empty vessel on that too. Um, I'm interested in the critique that he had of the uh, publicly listed company that you, yeah. you, you discussed. And I was just, I, I, I guess I'm just trying to, you, you know, which with the benefit of hindsight today, you would say, well, he was wrong. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. was, that was actually a very successful model. It's yeah. Yeah. generated all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. But then I was thinking, well, maybe in his mind, was it tied up very directly with the monopoly issue and the, you know, you use the East India Company as your example. Uh, or if not, what was his concern? Well, it was some degree tied up with it. He thought that a joint stock company was so disastrous, it had to have a legal monopoly in order to survive, right? No joint stock company could survive in a genuine competitive environment. Now, as you, you've observed, that seems to be, again, very pre-industrial um, outlook. Right in the 19th century, the joint stock company, first in the United States, later in Britain and the world, became a hugely um, su successful entity. But hey, let's be fair to Smith. I mean, what he's talking about is separation of management from control. You know, very familiar theme to any student of industry economics, and the abuse, if you like, or the misuse of um, the company uh, by management to um, you know feather their own nests. I mean, I think that's a very familiar trope, right? in any study of, of corporate life. So Smith might have got the wrong end of it in one way, but in another way, I think he was, he was onto something. Thanks, William, that was really interesting. Can I pose a devil's advocate's question? That is the requirement to have a shipping monopoly um, may have been inspired by economies of scale. That is, there's such a small amount of trade from any parts of the world with Australia that, that unless there's the appropriate scale that can be provided, you won't have, Britain will be out of the service. So the monopoly may well have been designed to serve a scale. You can look at it in terms of what Smith thought, but you also just look in terms of pure economics, and in pure economics I can't understand it. I mean, if, if um, having uh, uh, big ships, oh, there's only possible, if a big ship is more economic than a small ship, well, big ships will capture the market. Now, you could come back and say, oh, but that's a kind of monopoly, isn't it? Maybe you could have an argument um, like that. Um, but um, if, there's, you know, uh, if there's any cost advantage in being big, won't competition produce bigness? Yes. <laughs> Tony? Well, is there anyone else? Because I've talked enough. That's fine. Oh, I was just going to say, on respect to the Navigation Act, there is this element where they could twist uh, Smith to their favour, which is Navigation Act is one of his exceptions to liberty because uh, um, you have to ensure you have a, dom a domestic ship shipping fleet in case of war, right? So th this creates, a, you, you can upend economic liberty for the sake of the higher uh, uh, p political or defence um, thing. Yeah, that's right. He, one reason why he was easy on the Navigation Acts is because it encouraged, uh, it was helpful defence. Yeah. Question. Question. 
the back. Back row here. Um, just in terms of applying his theories to modern times, what do you think Smith would do with our current challenges for Aboriginal people in Australia in terms of what you've talked about in terms of slavery and human rights abuses? Gosh, you know, that's a really hard question. That's, that's a really hard question. The only thing I would, only thing I can offer, now, offer up on that is Smith's discussion of the impact of the discovery by de Gama, around going Cape Hope and Columbus across the, across the Atlantic, the implications of that for the existing inhabitants of the New World. And you can find that, well, I, I can't, it's certainly in the Wealth of Nations, and of course, he's very fascinated by the creation of a global market, right? All the wants and needs of the world can, that we can help each other by supplying it across the oceans, isn't that great? And yet, he's surprisingly hesitant about saying, well, therefore, it's a good thing. Why is that? Because he's concerned about the impact of the discovery, of these discoveries on the inhabitants of the, of the new world, you know, the indigenous inhabitants of the new world. And he speaks of the great cruelty and suffering. And then it, it's as if he can't make up his mind. Was it really worthwhile for them? And then he says, well, look, it's not so much that the discoveries directly caused their suffering. It was, that was sort of an incidental implication. Knowledge itself will, in the end, bring them back up too. That's what he's saying. He's a real enlightenment believer. Knowledge itself will bring the indigenous inhabitants of the new world right up the top too eventually. So ultimately he's optimistic about the power of knowledge. I think that's the one thing I can say in response to that question. Our last question. One over here. Over here. Um, your thesis about uh, profits and uh, management uh, padding and things of that sort uh, appeared to be a little bit flawed to me um, in the sense that that money just doesn't disappear. That money that's made by management leads to one, uh, if it's padding, possibly employment. Uh, secondly, build up of capital by the owners of, of whatever that business is. They have to invest that somewhere. Um, why, um, I mean, one could be critical of that, but um, surely that was another feedback in the process. Well, um, all I can say is there's reality in these models. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, I think, a reasonable, half reasonable model. Um, the model, you'll notice, um, as I observed, leaves the profits of, of the owners of the East India Company um, actually reduced, right? It's, it's, it's managers, if you like, quasi-salaries, which get padded. Uh, um, the profits of the owners are reduced. That would discourage uh, investment. It doesn't encourage employment by raising costs. It's discouraged, well, it's certainly discouraged output. Employment might be a more ambiguous thing. And of course, it's harmed consumers. So I think it's pretty bad news all around, except for management. 